Everyone still want to be here? <laughs> yes. So this is a session really about you know, Adam Smith. Um, <coughs> so um, I'm Mary Morgan. I'm um, at the London School of Economics. I'm a professor of history and philosophy of economics. Uh, so I'm delighted to be uh, chairing this session. We have a really great lineup, and I'm going to introduce the lineup first, and then I'm going to say a couple of things, my own view about Adam Smith. Uh, and then I'll, we'll go through without further introductions. Um, <coughs> so the order in which we're going to talk, after I've said a couple of things, uh, first of all, Chris Berry, who's, who's here, who has this very nice short introduction. Bye, bye, bye. <laughs> <laughs> very good. So he's a professor emeritus from Glasgow um, and written widely on the Scottish Enlightenment. And um, uh, as those of people who are uh, luckily enough to be elected fellows of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, um, uh, Chris is lucky enough to have that honour in his name. So Chris will uh, speak first after I do. Neil Kay, who's at the uh, far end here, is one of the main engineers of getting this meeting into Panmore House. And you can see that we're almost the first meeting to come in here. It's a wonderfully new place. Um, Chris, sorry, Neil is a professorial fellow at Edinburgh Business School and an emeritus professor of economics at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. I think that's correct, um, and is editing a set of readings on the evolution of the theory of the firm um, with David. Um, <coughs> following uh, Neil, we'll have Franco, who's um, too long from me, who's a professor of applied economics at Bocconi University, um, editor of Industrial and Corporate Change, and president of the International Schumpeter Society. I'm picking out things that for me seem important, so I'm sure they have lots of other great things that they could uh, be saying about themselves if they were introducing themselves. John Kay, who's already spoken to us, um, a fellow of the British Academy and the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And for me, the interesting thing is shortlisted for the Orwell Prize for Political Writing. That is quite something, I think, to, have to hold up one's hand about. Um, and also winner of the Saltaire Literary Prize for Nonfiction, uh, which is another great thing to have um, on your belt. I want to say a couple of things about um, Adam Smith. Um, as a uh, professor of the history of economics, I teach the history of economics, um, and um, our title here is What We Forgot About Adam Smith and What Adam Smith Didn't Know. So I want to say one thing about each of those. What have we forgotten about Adam Smith? To me, the most important thing we've forgotten is that Adam Smith did not start the wealth of nations with self-interest. <coughs> it's not just that he started it with the pin factory, but he actually had a portrait of economic man which was very broad, Economic Mad had instincts, talents, um, motivational virtues, and preferences. And they all matter. You cannot get the Wealth of Nations account if you don't have all of these. The most important first thing is the propensity to truck, barter, and exchange. We are exchanging animals, not fighting animals. We have talents, which means that when we are born, we have slightly different talents, so that people specialize by the division of labor, they specialize more, so they exacerbate their talents. That difference between people is what creates the surplus, which can then get exchanged. So the instinct for truck barter and exchange is very closely related to the talent issue. And that's what creates production and commerce. There's a set of important motivational virtues, self-command, prudence, and parsimony. And those, along with reasoning power, goal-directed reasoning power, not axiomatic choice rationality, but that reasoning power the use of self-command, prudence, and parsimony creates investment. Without investment, you don't get much division of labor. Right? So we've got trade, capacity to exchange, initial differences of talents creating a surplus, <coughs> all of these motivational virtues which create investment, <coughs> and that's what creates uh, the growth. But something that almost is always forgotten is the preferences that Adam Smith thought we had as people. Look outside the window. Can you see trees? Well, for Adam Smith, this was an important thing. He, had a, he thought that we had a preference for living in the country over the town and for living at home, not overseas. That's what determined the order of investment, first in agriculture, then in home manufacturing, and only third in um, com commerce overseas. So it's that order which creates the theory of development, such as there is a theory of development. In other words, self-interest on its own doesn't get you very far, nor does just having empathy. Empathy and self-interest are great, but actually you need all those other bits to get the wealth of nations system going. 
So those are the pluses which we've forgotten. I think the thing that's really missing for me as a historian of economics is he lacks a really good theory of distribution. That's what the classical economists Ricardo and Marx take up. What happens? Who gets what out of the cake? How is the income and wealth that's created, how is it distributed through classes? And we're not thinking here of classes of upper, middle, lower. We're thinking about classes of economic actors. For Ricardo, landlords, capitalists, and laborers. Marx uh, makes life a bit easier for himself by getting rid of the landlords out of real consideration and figuring out the distribution between labor and capital. But Ricardo really struggles to think out of a dis theory of distribution, laws of distribution, that will take account of this class of landlords who basically have control of the assets but don't actually do the capitalist investment. So that struggle for creating a theory or a set of laws of distribution, I think, is what falls out in neoclassical economics. It's really difficult, I think, to get back to that, particularly as neoclassical economics, the beginning of end of the 19th and 20th century, focuses on consumers as the creators of wealth or the co-creators of wealth and income. And that makes it much more difficult to create a theory of distribution going back uh, to these uh, economic groups of labor, capital, and owners of assets. I think that's one of the struggles that I think Lynn was pointing to this morning about rethinking what that uh, theory of distribution could be. I think also John referred to it. So those are my two points that I wanted to make, and I'd like to turn it uh, now next to my neighbor, Chris. Okay, thank you. Um, I will stand up so I can see people. Uh, I like to have people, how many people are sleeping at the back. It's always a clue how it's going. Um, I'm just going to say, obviously, a 10 minute uh, will win synopsis of bits of, of Smith. And the first thing I want to say is that we shouldn't shortchange him intellectually. Um, he had a wide range of competences and interests and publications. He was a historian, a jurisprudentialist, a grammarian, a literary critic, a rhetorician. Uh, he wrote a extremely interesting history of astronomy, which is noted not simply because of the erudition he, he, he employed in that, or uh, a wonderful system, but more importantly, in many ways, more interestingly, it was an account of how human beings are motivated to try and explain the world around them. And of course he wrote moral philosophy, moral sentiments, and the wealth of nations and political economy. Despite that range, there is a, a whole. Smith is not to be compartmentalized. His work, in a sense, interpenetrates. Um, you can see it in the text, if you know the text very well. But two sort of markers of that is um, that the final edition of the moral sentiments, the sixth edition, published in the year of his death in 1790, he was working with after Wealth of Nations, 1776. So he carried on with his moral philosophy. And the other that were marker is if you look at the title page of the first and subsequent edition of the Wealth of Nations, it says, Formerly Professor of Moral Philosophy at the University of Glasgow, where I am. So that's partly one thing, just should appreciate the range of what, what he's about. I wanted to say, say something briefly about the moral sentiments on the wealth of nations, because those are what people uh, are interested about, or know Smith about, and should know more about. Moral sentiments, theory of moral sentiments, this is an investigation. Um, it comes clearer in the third edition of the moral sentiments. It added a subtitle. And the subtitle said, this is an analysis of the principles whereby we come to make judgments about others and ourselves. An analysis of principles, a theory. It's not a moralizing text. Smith is not telling you how to live. He's telling you how it is that people come to make judgments. It is an enlightenment science of morality. This book, you enlightenment, this is the enlightenment. And the enlightenment motivated in many ways by this concern to let us put moral subjects, as David Hume called it, onto an explanatory scientific study. And that's what Smith was about in the moral sentiments. What is the key proposition, conclusion, 
thrust of the moral sentiment is this, that socialization is moralization, moralization is socialization. We are educated to, we learn how to behave in society, and then we internalize that and learn how to evaluate ourselves. It's a process of learning, a process of habit and custom and so on. We learn how to cope in society, how to behave properly. And one manifestation of that is that if you act properly, other people will act properly in return. So if you act in a trustworthy manner, people will trust you and you will trust them. So you get, in a sense, the way in which we are able to develop common senses of judgment, common senses of justice, and so on. Now this is important because it's one of the bridges to the wealth of nations. Because why is trust important? Trust is important because you can rely on people, have confidence in other people. And you need confidence and reliability if you're going to have markets. Because markets will depend upon a future being relatively stable. Specialised now to sell later. So this is one of the ways in which the theory of the moral sentiments is in fact underpins the theory of what Smith in The Wealth of Nations calls the assembly of strangers, an anonymous society. And what The Wealth of Nations is about is how you cope, well, what moral sentiments is about is how you cope in a society of strangers. A commercial society, as Smith calls it, where every man, using obviously gendered terms in the 18th <coughs> century, is in some sense a merchant. So I now turn a few words about wealth of nations. <coughs> Given there's this connection here between, in a sense, the moral psychology and the foundation of one of the building blocks, as Murray's indicated, in how, in fact, we interact in markets. Again, the title is important. It's not the wealth of nations. It's an inquiry, in, it's an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. It's a scientific endeavour, looking for causal accounts. It's historical and analytical. In fact, historical is important in a way of trying to establish what political economy that <coughs> you need to understand where you've come from. A commercial society is one of a sort of society, and so they contrast that sort of society with predecessors. When he talks about, in a sense, the, the science of human nature, one of the phrases he uses, science of political economy, science of legislator, the model of science, like virtually all Enlightenment <coughs> thinkers, is Newtonian. In a, in a sort of, not Newtonianism, but Newtonian sense, the first rule of philosophy, explain a lot by a little. That's what you're trying to do. And that's what Smith was recognised having done. He explained the range of bewilderingly, increasingly bewildering economic phenomena by a few simple principles, and Merritt indicated a few of them in her remarks. So you move from exchanging, that requires markets, this will historically develop. Markets in order to survive need security, of security you need governments, governments need support, so you need taxation. So all these things run through the book. You start off with a simple division of labour and you end up with public debt. And it all in a sense can be flowed out through a few simple principles. And Smith's uh, former pupil and colleague famously called uh, Adam Smith the Newton of political economy because he'd done that. The conflict of a person named Newton was a honorific term in the 18th century. This is the thing, everyone aspired to be a Newton of the field. Uh, and Smith was regarded as the Newton of political economy. So that's part of the, the sort of title. Um, then the wealth in the title. Um, we shouldn't think this, is, this, this isn't riches. Smith is explicitly talking about universal opulence. Because part of the thrust of the wealth of nations is how we've left miserable poverty and are now moving into the commercial era of greater prosperity. And what the marker of prosperity is, first of all, everybody and Smith is quite categorical about this, everybody has better food, better lodging, and better clothing than earlier years. And this matters. It comes down to it, what matters to people's living is the food, the clothing, and where they live. 
and that's improved. But it's not simply a question of materiality. Because of the capacity that's come about, we now have resources to look after the vulnerable. Again, Smith contrasts the miserable poverty of the first era, where infanticide was practiced because of indigency. Now we have the resources to look after the vulnerable. And beyond that, because we can now have what he calls unproductive labour, we can have professors, we can have poets, <laughs> we can have priests, we can have artists, we can have conjurers, I people who make life worthwhile. Smith is not to be pigeonholed as an economic man in that sense. We are creatures who do not live by bread alone. And that's important. So that's do as well. Now, I just want to say a little bit about a phrase that's going to get bandied around, and will be bandied around, invisible hand. Smith is a nuanced writer. That's why the books are damn big. Um, because he qualifies everything. There's hardly any dramatic statement I'll end with one of them. So when you come to Invisible Hand, one reference, where is it? You look hard. There's no chapter heading. There's no side. It's in the middle of a paragraph in book four. That's it. And what does he say there? Well, it's not a straightforward statement at all. It's typical Smith. It's harboured around with qualifications. So he, what he actually says is, it's not always the worst, like sometimes it can be, it's not always the worst for society or the public interest, but people follow their own interests. And he immediately follows that by saying, frequently, i.e. not invariably or necessarily, is it the case that public pursuing self-interest will promote public interest. So the, it's built into the structure of the thing are these qualifications. And this is because what the invisible hand, in the same passage read, as in many other cases, and the many other cases is referring to a more basic phenomena, which Adam Ferguson talks about, which John uh, mentioned in his lecture this morning, but common throughout this question line of unintended consequences. Now, not all unintended consequences are benign. The invisible hand mechanism can produce malign outcomes. And Smith identifies malign outcomes for the invisible hand. Yeah, I'm, I've finished almost. Uh, <laughs> one, vision of labour produces damage to the virtues of the pin makers. Stable government produces accumulation of public debt. Final thing, I said that Smith did, was a nuanced writer, but he did have one or two laboratory statements, one of which, in Book 5, Wealth of Nations, he says, science is the great antidote to superstition. If you want a rallying cry for a crazy la femme, Smith's equivalent is, science is the great antidote to superstition. New enlightenment, identify your own superstitions. Identify your new science. I think if there's going to be a new alignment, it has to take up this notion of science against superstition, whether it's stock market algorithms, fake news, or whatever else you want to call it. <coughs> in fact, we'll replace it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Well, first of all, I, I listened to, uh, first of all, David's opening remarks, and, and then to John's uh, keynote speech, and then to Christopher here, and I was progressively more and more heartened that they were covering things which I was going to look at myself, and then became progressively disheartened <laughs> by the fact that I realised that I might be to some extent duplicating the areas they've covered. So if you'll forgive <coughs> me, my notes here are covered with scribbles and deletions, and if it makes a coherent uh, narrative that's purely by accident, and it may be a reflection or not of what... Uh, John was talking about in terms of evolutionary rationality. I want to mention three things. One is a thing that we forgot about Adam Smith, but in fact David, John and Christopher have reminded us. Um, and that is the role of his aspects of human behaviour in his writings. I'll deal with that in a minute. The second thing is the role of innovation, which he's often criticised for in his writings. And we forgot that there was a more subtle aspect to his attitudes towards innovation. 
And the third thing is one thing that Adam Smith did not know and could not have known, but I think is one of the great institutional innovations of the 20th and now 21st century, which is often seen purely for its failure. So I'll deal with them <coughs> each briefly. Um, as has been mentioned, particularly by David in his prefacing remarks, um, the theory of moral sentiments helped frame the wealth of nations. Uh, but in the opening sentence of the theory of moral sentiments is a sentence itself, which might be taken to frame both the, the, the forthcoming book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, but also his attitude in general. And it goes basically, how selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the future, in the fortune of others, and render their happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. And that complements his later view of the more distant commercial, as been mentioned, relationships associated with uh, the marketplace. Uh, it's not uh, instead of, it's a complement to it. In the theory of moral sentiments, you'll encounter such things as fairness, loss aversion, intertemporal choice, such as deferred gratification, sympathy, which he described as one aspect of human nature, we would now call empathy and altruism. But particularly the role of trust, something which runs through the theory of moral sentiments, but also into the wealth of nations. Um, there's one sentence which I, I speak from memory, which I think captures his attitude in the theory of moral sentiments, and it is that there is nothing which distinguishes a common street porter or a philosopher, and a philosopher to him was someone who was a scientist or a pursuer of knowledge, there's nothing so much as, as divides them as their education and their upbringing. And that was truly a radical thought for the 18th century, where so much was based upon patronage and aristocracy and so on. These days, I'll just finish this part by saying, these days it's so tempting to blame others uh, for our problems, such as racial problems, uh, immigration, <coughs> ethnic or religious issues. And he does, I think, restore the idea of humanity uh, as something which is fundamental to the way that we should view human society. The second aspect, which I think is important, we've forgotten, but in fact, David, John and Christopher have reminded us, is about innovation. Innovation itself um, was little discussed in Adam Smith, if by that we mean technological innovation. Um, the Karen Aaron works, which uh, John mentioned in his talks, um, were actually a relatively close shot because there was a great fear of property rights being loose and ill-defined in the 18th century. And in fact, his owner, John Roebuck, had uh, earlier had some of his uh, intellectual property and a chemical works stolen and was very careful to exclude from sight uh, those prying eyes that might steal his secret. So it would actually have been difficult for Smith to get it. Not, not impossible, because he did know and was a friend of John Roebuck. As for James <coughs> Watt, who was a friend of Adam Smith, you might think that this would be, a, this would be a, someone whose insights would help him. James Watt himself said in 1773, my steam engine is worthless. The market values it no more than a farthing, which was not much money in those days, less than a penny. Um, so James Watt in those days was a failure in terms of developing the steam engine, but in fact he was a great success and recognised as such as an inventor or a tinkerer, uh, a developer of machines. Uh, Adam Smith in fact paid six guineas, which in today's money is worth about £1,200 or £1,500, $1, for a copying machine which James Watt had invented, which shows his faith in and ability to, and his willingness to purchase from his friend something which was, in those days, not a proven technology. Where I think we have genuinely forgotten Smith's contribution in terms of innovation was not so much in technological innovation, but in monetary innovation. Um, he talked about, in his work, the first two public banks in Scotland, the spread of retail banking, the substitution of metal money by paper, and the overdraft facility, which it's such a trite thing these days, but with a radical innovation when the Royal Bank of Scotland introduced it. Um, and there's one little phrase from 
Adam Smith, which I think captures his view of the role of banking, and that was he saw it as a sort of wagon way through the air to enable the country to increase very considerably the annual produce of its land and labour. In other words, he saw banking as a facilitator. And in those days, remember how embryonic many of the institutions for banking were that we take for granted now. So while we focus on its failures, and indeed Adam Smith did focus on its failures, he talked about uh, the problems of speculation, bankruptcy, bank runs, reckless bank lending, contagion, and the need for better regulation, um, which ran through much of his work, not just in the case of banking, but also in, in commerce. Um, the, role of, the role of banking and its failures as an innovation was something that was very central to him. And it's something we could do well to remember now when we look at financial innovation uh, in 2008 with the financial crisis, sub, subprime lending, uh, but also the role of Bitcoin. These are not new problems. They were experienced in other contexts in the 18th century and observed by Adam Smith. One last thing I'd like to turn to um, is, is something which, again, just much like banking failures and financial catastrophe, is something which, in terms of uh, common discussion and, and the newspapers and the media generally, is characterized by failure, is something that Adam Smith could not have known about, um, but yet I think he would be genuinely impressed by. And that is the European single market. Because the idea of sovereign nations getting together to pool some of their sovereignty into a common pot called the single market um, and sacrifice that for the greater benefit of being part of an enlarged single market, that is something which, in terms of how it's evolved, wasn't properly recognized in the 20th century, never mind in the 18th century when Adam Smith wrote. Because when the common market in Europe was created, it was presumed that tariff barriers would um, be the major impediment to trade and commerce between the nations. As it turned out by the 1980s, it, it was the non-tariff barriers which became a problem. And each nation was pursuing their own self-interest to erect these barriers to try to benefit themselves at the expense of others. And there was a white paper in 1985. Um, I would invite you to read it as I glance through it again and remind myself. It's probably one of the most boring papers in the annals of history because it is largely concerned with such matters as health and safety and industrial standards. The basic philosophy behind the European single market and its completion was the idea you could do two things. You could harmonize standards and get the same standards across the block. Um, standards for health and safety and standards for industrial standards. Where needed? Where needed was the important thing. Where they were not needed, you had mutual recognition. And the basic rule was if something was safe um, to make and to, to sell in a particular <coughs> country, it was safe to make and sell to the other countries in the European single market. Um, the fact they were able to do that, balance harmonization of standards and mutual recognition, I think genuinely is one of the great institutions of the 20th and 21st century when it comes to global aspects. And indeed, I'd like to finish my, my remarks here by drawing, drawing attention to there were, there were two um, events took place last week. Vladimir Putin described and documented what he believed was the death of liberal, liberal society and ideology in the West. Less, less documented and less plotted, um, and you have to search the smaller print in many of the uh, uh, parts of the media, was the fact that the European Union has concluded a major trading agreement with Mercosur, the major trading bloc in South America. It's been 20 years in the making and will create one of the biggest blocks, if not the biggest bloc, uh, traders in the world. And again, it comes from the strength that I think was created in the single European market, much dis disparaged though it is, and its robustness despite all the problems that have been encountered down the years. So,
these are my three contributions, two things we have for forgotten to an extent, and one thing that Adam Smith uh, could not have known. Thank you very much. I'd like to start from uh, what Mary uh, said at the beginning of this session and also what David uh, mentioned today that he's looking back to Adam Smith uh, in order to look forward. Uh, and uh, uh, today it has been emphasized uh, uh, that Adam Smith uh, discussed uh, a market-based economy and also David said, well, dynamic efficiency plays a major role. But I'd like uh, to discuss with you what is the engine of this Adam Smith market-based economy? In a sense, what triggers uh, growth in this economy? And I'd like to start from the great discussion of John Kay on the pin factory. And of course, uh, uh, go back to uh, chapter one, two, and three, of the wealth of nation, but look uh, at these chapters in a dynamic way. And I want to make uh, a point uh, that is different from the legacy uh, of Adam Smith uh, in this respect on vertical integration and so on. And I want to make the point uh, that uh, there is, uh, I think, another key legacy uh, that comes out from chapters one and three of the wealth of nation as uh, economic growth driven by knowledge and the emergence and dynamics of vertically related industries. In a sense, I want to discuss about this point uh, in, my, in the few minutes uh, that uh, I have. We all know chapter one and three uh, about the division of labor that increase uh, the productive power of labor, makes uh, specialization uh, possible uh, chapter 3 says, well, the uh, division of labor is limited by the extent uh, of the market. We all know very well that this point uh, and these chapters originated a strong legacy. Strong legacy, I say, I just mentioned three people, George Stigler, and, you know, discussing the uh, 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 vertical integration or specialization as limited or, or not by, by the extent of the market. Alin Young on increasing returns uh, and uh, the role of externalities and the growth of new industries, and uh, Nate Rosenberg in discussing the convergence or not of industries in the process of economic growth, uh, having in mind the machine tools uh, in the United States. Strong, strong legacy, which uh, we all studied uh, when we were undergraduate or graduate studies. But today I want to make another point. We're reading uh, chapter, uh, chapters <laughs> one, two, and three, and uh, taking a dynamic perspective. And, uh, and if you read the chapters, you have some hints uh, of, of this uh, view of uh, economic growth uh, as driven by knowledge uh, and the dynamics of vertically related industries. First of all, Adam Smith talks about uh, the increase in the dexterity of workers, experience matters. Then it talks about invention of machines uh, due to the ingenuity of the makers of the machines. So in a sense, innovation is important. But then there's another point, and this was also raised uh, this morning, talking about science. And he mentioned that uh, there in, 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 in the economy, uh, improvements made by men of speculations, speculation that he talks philosophers or make of speculation, who combine the power of the most distant object. And then he says, well, integrator of developed knowledge. In a sense. And then he follows and says, men of speculations are divided in many branches and become expert in their own branch. It's a way to discuss about knowledge the development of knowledge, the integration of knowledge as a key uh, uh, factor in, uh, in, uh, in, in the development uh, of, uh, of the economy. Then, of course, uh, talks uh, 
is not, not in depth about innovation. David Tiss already mentioned this morning. He has also a nice passage of uh, changes in transportation. Because he says, well, when you move from land carriage to water carriage, markets expand. But water carriage is a different technology, a different type of, of knowledge. So in a sense, also, you have kind of uh, changes uh, in, uh, in, in the infrastructure. And then what I want to uh, just uh, uh, mention briefly because we've been emphasized uh, continued this morning, this economic growth based on, uh, say, experience and knowledge and innovation is grounded in institutions. A market-based economy is basically as developed some <coughs> institutions that make uh, the uh, economy grow. So I, I go to uh, the point that this view of uh, knowledge, uh, innovation, and institutions is very much close to an evolutionary view of uh, economic growth. An evolutionary view of Nelson and Winter, uh, Stan Metcalf, uh, Giovanni Dosi, and so on, as a process <coughs> by which uh, uh, people and companies learn, uh, uh, develop knowledge, accumulate capabilities, uh, and uh, 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 are active uh, in an environment, in an economy in which institutions play a role. Institutions, not just IPR, regulation, and standards, but also uh, the public actor, the public actor and university. We talk about science and so on. So uh, my, my, my reading of, uh, 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 following this point, my reading of Adam Smith is that this economic growth is very much close and related to the emergence and dynamics of vertically related industries. In a sense, Adam Smith uh, considered uh, industrial transformation as a dynamic process uh, which sees the rise and growth of specialized industries. But the rise and growth of specialized industries because they are related to other ones. And uh, uh, keep in mind that uh, he, uh, in chapter one, discussed the woolen uh, coat and says, well, you know, you, you can move from uh, a craftsman uh, that does the wooden coat to <coughs> various activities that spin out uh, and become uh, independent, uh, indus independent activities. So this is actually a way to see in a dynamic way the emergence of vertically related uh, industries. I think it's a very interesting and very powerful way to see the engine of economic growth. Having said that, that, what lessons uh, can we uh, draw from uh, this way that of Adam Smith that I presented now? In the sense that uh, economic growth uh, uh, driven by knowledge and the dynamics of vertically related industry, the emergence of specialization, the emergence. So, uh, in a sense, that specialization comes out from existing uh, industries. Well, the first consideration, which is obvious and most of you will agree with me, is that uh, industries, when we examine uh, the way uh, companies and so on, should not be examined in isolation as discrete entity, but uh, and definitely not with well-defined boundaries, uh, and not static. But in a sense, the boundaries of industries are continuously redefined by knowledge and reshaped by knowledge. Let me just be blunt and say that uh, the division of labor among firms uh, and industries is divided by the division of knowledge. And, uh, and the boundaries of industries are affected by the boundaries of knowledge. It's enough to look at the development of ICT in the last 40 years, how new industries have emerged and how knowledge is spanned from one industry to another. Second, a point that comes out from reading uh, the woolen coat uh, passage of Adam Smith uh, and so on, that industries do not start in a vacuum. Uh, they do not pop up in a sudden, but they emerge and evolve out of existing ones. This is a very strong point. I think that one can read from Adam Smith. In a sense, the incubation period, the incubation period of an industry plays a tremendously important role. And where incubation period, I mean what the period comes from uh, some knowledge floating around to the first commercialization of, of, of a product. 
where basically not only knowledge, but also institutions, public, and companies play a role. And this is a very long uh, and cumulative process. Again, <coughs> it's enough uh, to, to, to link it uh, the discussion to the internet, to the merger of the internet, and how many uh, actors, how, many, how much different knowledge has played a role in the incubation period, and has shaped uh, greatly also the emergence of the industry. Uh, yes, I'm done. I'm done. The third is uh, 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 seeing industrial dynamics, uh, what uh, something that we all are interested in, not the industrial dynamics of a single industry, but the dynamics of vertically related industries. Think of semiconductors, electronics, and so on. And what I want to uh, stress here is not just uh, in terms of vertical integration, which we all know, but also firms that uh, cross industry boundaries in terms of startups, vertical spin outs. In a sense, firms that employees that leave one company upstream and open a company downstream driven by knowledge. This is not a, a, a minor point. In the United States, uh, in the semiconductor and telecom industry, 30% of startups do not come, startups, new firms, do not come from the same industry. They come from related industries, either upstream or downstream. Specialization and division of labor. So let me conclude. So in a sense that uh, uh, if we look uh, uh, in this way, uh, chapters one uh, and three of the wealth of nation, and this view of uh, economic growth as associated to industrial transformation, well, industrial transformation driven by uh, knowledge and the dynamics of vertically related industry, we can see how knowledge and capabilities and the movement of firms uh, a new enterprise span over different industries. This is the, what Smith were discussing the process of increasing specialization. And I think this is a very powerful lesson that we can draw from Adam Smith. I think it has major implications, at least for me, in reading uh, and understanding the industrial transformation that we see in the 21st century nowadays. Thank you. Thank you very much. John, the floor is yours. Thanks, Mary. We, it's an occasion like this, it's easy to say a lot about Adam Smith and how prescient he was. I think we should also not forget just how different the economy in which Adam Smith was operating was from the one in which we operate today. The famous pin factory supposedly employed 10 people. Even the Karen Ironworks, uh, which he didn't visit, employed only 1,200 people. I was quite interested in Neil's remark that uh, if he visited the Karen Ironworks, he might not have got that in. Uh, I didn't quote the second verse of Burns' uh, impromptu iron on, on, on the Karen Ironworks, which says, but when we turn all at your door, your porter don't not hear us. See me, should we to hell's yet come, your billy safe and sear us. If that's not immediately comprehensible, let me do the translation. So when we rang your bell, your porter didn't pay any attention to us. And we <coughs> hope that we, if we go to hell, Satan will similarly ignore <coughs> our anxiety to be let in. Um, well, that's not really what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> um, uh, I might make two points. One, Chris framed the idea that uh, part of what the Wealth of Nations was about was how we cope in a society of strangers, how market economy functions there. I think as we move into a 21st century economy, the answer is in most areas, we don't because actually products are far too complex, far too differentiated for anonymous transactions to be possible. And a lot of what we're seeing in a modern economy, like the developments we were talking about this morning, in terms of the kind of intermediation that's represented by Google or by Uber or by Amazon, is designed to remove the anonymity from transactions and make actually commerce and 
And if you want to reinforce <coughs> that point, you might note the uh, entirely mistaken attempt to believe that one could successfully anonymize transactions in house purchase, mortgages, and business lending through securitization. Uh, an experiment which manifestly failed in 2008, although it still seems to continue. The second point I'd like to make takes us back to the issues of moral philosophy. In the draft of a paper which I talked about in the plenary, um, I wrote there's a difference between being fair and acting fairly because it's one in one's interest to act fairly. And I got, I, I circulated that draft to just a handful of people. And two of the responses were, I don't understand that remark. I should say I put after it as that the Scottish moral <coughs> philosophers of the Enlightenment would have little difficulty in disposing of this proposition. But it's clear that modern people do have some difficulty in disposing of that proposition. Uh, so let me explain it. And there are several ways of explaining it. Uh, but one is ethical behavior is not what you do uh, when something is in your self-interest. It is what you do when something is not in your self-interest. And if you leave your jackets or bags on the back of the chair during these sessions, you do not expect that I will steal your wallet. And I will not, in fact, steal your wallet. Uh, <laughs> And I don't steal your wallet, not because I have calculated that, uh, uh, the damage to my reputation or the risk of being apprehended by police Scotland is such that it's, uh, in the long run, not in my interest to steal your wallet. In fact, I rather suspect that you think it's so unlikely that I would steal your wallet that actually there's a very good chance I would get away with it. <laughs> and you would conclude that you had dropped your wallet or lost it in, in some other way. Uh, and the, the trait, the personality characteristic of non-wallet stealing is materially different from uh, the policy of non-wallet stealing. This was expressed by moral philosopher Bishop Butler two centuries ago when he said honesty may be the best policy, but the man who adopts that policy is not an honest man. There's a difference between the personality characteristic of honesty and the policy of honesty. And as humans, we're actually quite good at detecting the difference between the two, the purely instrumental and the underlying characteristic. And of course, the importance to that to a lot of the discussion of industrial organization, which we're in the process of having, is people who want to say that, well, profitable business is good business, and good business is profitable business. And of course, uh, business will be concerned about the welfare of employees, the happiness of customers, and uh, its relationship and reputation in the community, because all these things are in the long, it's in the long run. It's not our interest. And there is some truth in that, but there is not 100% truth in that. And there is a difference which people will notice between uh, saying, we have introduced this employee benefit policy because we have a report from McKinsey that says if we do so, introduce these benefits, it will reduce staff turnover by an amount that will reduce our costs in the long run. And to say we've introduced this employee benefit policy because we actually care about our employees. And people know uh, uh, that there is a difference there. And they react accordingly in the way they treat the organization, just as you will respond to me differently if you believe that I'm a non-wallet stealer because I don't steal wallets. Uh, than if I don't steal your wallet because I have, for the moment, a policy of not stealing your wallet. If only because you can never be sure that this is not the time when I, I decide that policy is no longer in my best interest. Uh, to conduct a dialogue about moral philosophy, 
in these kind of terms is simply to misunderstand what moral philosophy is about. And we should go back to the people of the 18th century who understood how one needed to integrate moral philosophy uh, with economic thinking and not <coughs> regard these as things that are essentially separately from comfort monumentalized, uh, but the links can be explained by models of axiomatic rationality. They come. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, panel. I'm very impressed that we managed to get down to uh, just before <coughs> 10 past 12. Um, we started quarter an hour late. I suggest we might take an extra five minutes um, if there's a good discussion going. Um, I'd like to call for questions or interventions from the floor. I'd like to take three at once so that we have several ideas and that gives a panel a chance to choose some interactions. I'd be grateful if you would say who you are uh, when you raise your um, point. Are you going to be bring, coming around with a mic because this is all being recorded? So the first gentleman's here. So anybody else who'd like to raise a point <coughs> in the first round? Go ahead, please. Um, <coughs> Henry Chesbrough from UC Berkeley. Thanks very much to the panel. Uh, Mary, I wanted to pick up on a comment you made, which was about the theories of distribution and indeed redistribution. Uh, I think the political economists of the 18th and 19th century have given way to a division of labor between economists on the one side and political scientists and others on the other. And we've lost, as an economics profession, the ability to do much, say much, discuss much about redistribution. And apart from your comments, even our own esteemed panel has really focused on the supply side of all this, when I think there's a strong case that much of what brings us together is on the demand side or the redistribution side. Yep, thank you. Another question. <coughs> I can add. Another point, intervention? Something? Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry, <coughs> behind us. Hello, my name is Eve Poole. I'm the Third Church States Commissioner for England. Um, just a question to John, really, about ethics. Thank you very much for um, reminding us about policies versus um, virtue. Um, I wonder, given how um, invasive utilitarianism has been to the creation of uh, capitalism as we know it, um, how would we restore that sense of virtue ethics back into the market um, so that it wasn't so much about teleology and much more about the character of the people who are operating within it? One more. Yes, uh, just behind here. Yeah. Hello, um, I'm John DeFigueredo from Duke University. Um, we've been talking a lot about the need for uh, social awareness, equity, um, equality across markets. Um, I'm very interested in thinking about w how do we solve that problem. So I think there may be, even though there's a consensus that we should do this, I think the, the challenge is not whether we should or the question is how. And for me, um, there are issues related to cultural change, social norms, regulation. How do we think about this and how would the panelists think about this in terms of what Adam Smith might say or your additional <coughs> thoughts on that? Okay, thank you. Let's uh, pick up on those and let, let me have a go on, on this first one since it was addressed to me. Um, I think you know, you're, you're absolutely right that we, we sort of lost this issue in is a big general question. So in the 19th century, economists thought this was the question to deal with. What's the, what are the laws of distribution? Uh, and that comes from a basis of basic view that it's labor that creates value. Uh, it's, the, it's the supply side that creates the value in, in, in things. Uh, and so we've got to think about the distribution of returns to the factors of production in terms of uh, the labor being a basis of value and how, how does that change when you have to think about investment. Um, the late 19th century then economics turns into being a demand side kind of notion of economics. But the critical thing I think uh, it, which puts this really off the map, the distribution off the map, is that the welfare economics starts from an assumption that from the initial, initial distribution. We already are unequal. And given we already are unequal, how can we make the best possible outcome from that? And so really trying to put back onto the economics agenda the big question of how do we think about distribution? How do we start thinking about distribution when most of our theories are, are demand-side theories and when we don't start from the initial distribution? 
So I, I think you're absolutely right. Those are the two key points that I would just pick up on from that. Um, John, I think the second question was addressed to you. Um, right. And, and the second question was about virtue ethics and business. Um, <coughs> virtue ethics, of course, is most associated with Aristotle and the great modern proponent of Aristotelian virtue ethics is Alistair MacIntyre. And if you read Alistair MacIntyre, there's a kind of loathing of modern business that runs through every page. Uh, and there's a very interesting example of MacIntyre's thinking about this, because MacIntyre talks a great deal about uh, the concept of a practice. And one of his illustrations of the concept of a practice invites us to contrast two fishing crews. And one of the fishing crews is a fishing crew which is embedded in a community and where the members of the community value the practice of fishing and work together effectively in the terms I described this morning as a team. The other is a rationalist fishing crew organized on rational lines with people individually incentivized. And McIntyre describes the two crews clearly with admiration for the first and contempt for the second. But he doesn't go on to ask the economist question, which is which of these two crews would catch more fish? Uh, and as it happened, I discovered a couple of Harvard Business School cases that provide the answer to this question. Their studies of the Prelude Corporation. And the Prelude Corporation was set up in the late 1960s. And in terms of its then chief executive, it said, we're going to be the General Motors of the fishing industry. There's a certain irony of that. But they were going to be the General Motors of the fishing industry. The other guy, the little guy, he said, can't compete at scale. This is the future. Um, and, of course, you can imagine how the Prelude Corporation was structured and organized. The second Harvard Business School case on the Prelude Corporation is about bankruptcy of the Prelude Corporation. Um, if I can summarize that briefly, it is to say that in the terms I was describing this morning, team organization is social as well as narrowly economic. It's not primar exclusively or even primarily incentivized and uh, structured in terms of principal agent, agent relationships. And in complex structures were, in Williamson's terms, consummate rather than perfunctory cooperation is required. It's actually a more effective form of economic organization. And that truth, which in truth, many, most people in business really deep down know, is by emphasizing that, that we kind of make the links that I think you're asking us to achieve. Thank you. I think, Frankie, you wanted to come in on the same just question. One, one second, uh, just to answer, uh, indirectly, Harry's points about the man, which is, uh, I think, a very important point, not about distribution, I don't want to touch it, but uh, in a sense, in, in the same way I talk about dynamically, demand emerges uh, endogenously with the division of labor. In a sense that with the, with the breaking down uh, and the specialization of industries, you have the emergence of new intermediate demand that, that uh, enriches very much the, uh, the heterogeneity of demand in the system. So in a sense, also, there is another way to read uh, Adam Smith uh, in terms of demand uh, in a very dynamic way. Uh, where, where you have intermediate demand uh, coming out together with the specialization of industries uh, over time. Um, the third question, um, was that addressed to anybody particularly? No, um, sorry, I've actually I've forgotten what the question was, so just yeah. remind <laughs> me, please. It was thinking about the, um, if how you solve this problem. I have a sense we think about solving the problem that we seem to be in, which is the loss of the social norms and yeah. cultural values. That but what is the solution here? Do you think about regulation, social norms, cultural development? What, what would he say? And what um, would you say? Either the panels hasn't. Yet. Well, I'm I'm very doubtful that we can learn anything from Smith, uh, <laughs> and, and I think it's a bit of a wild goose chase. And part of the reason, as John just said, I mean the world is so different, um, and to extrapolate from Smith is an extrapolation 
uh, and it's cherry picking. You, you pick what you want. You can see in Smith the way that he would talk of socialization <laughs> and acculturation, that we are social beings. This can get corrupted, uh, and it can, you, there are means to correct corruption. But if, for example, there is no program. There. There's no program for doing that. These are, in a sense, um, ways of um, identifying issues. But Smith is not in that business. He's not in the business of distribution. I mean, for him, justice is not a question of distribution. Justice is a question of individual interaction. What he really talks about is police matters. And police matters are what deal with the, the fallout, as it were, from market transactions. He hasn't got a theory of distributive justice in that sense. Neil, do you want to add? Yeah, I, I would just add that in the case of Adam Smith, again, it reinforcing the point that John's already made, you have to remember this time and place. Uh, Scotland has been in a situation of great turmoil. Uh, it's, I mentioned financial innovation. The, the innovation which led to the uh, union of England and Scotland was the Darien disaster in the late 17th century, which, I, if, I, if I remember correctly, took up two-thirds of the money circulating in Scotland. It was a speculative venture, building a Scottish colony in the Isthmus of Panama. Mm -hmm. It failed miserably. Um, but that created the psyche and the context in which um, it had been, it was to become an area of turmoil. There was also all the political and religious turmoil that took place in the 18th century. Now, again, if my memory serves me right, witchcraft trials were still being held in Scotland at the time of uh, Smith's birth. Um, when you put it in those terms, uh, the, the, the thing that I think you get from Smith in this context is the stability which the Union uh, gave uh, Scotland uh, in the context of what had been a, a really turbulent time, politically, religiously, economically, over the 18th century. And I think that m must have influenced his, his attitude towards the distribution and the status quo. That uh, while, while, matters were, uh, while matters were unequal, nonetheless, it was a society which was more <coughs> stable than much of the decades which had preceded it. But actually, to expand on Neil's point, um, Scotland had m moved from being at the beginning of the 18th century, at the time of Union an extremely poor country on the periphery of Europe, yeah. which, as he described, had, had lost much of its middle class's wealth in a foolish speculation. It wasn't that foolish, actually. The idea that the Panama Canal area was pretty important and valuable, uh, given the <coughs> expansion of global trade, was absolutely right. It was just about a couple of hundred years premature. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, but Scotland was in desperate straits. And then by 1850, Scotland was effectively the richest part of the world. And that's an extraordinary combination of economic growth yeah. and intellectual <coughs> achievement. And Smith's, Smith was midway through that quite remarkable process. Yeah. And we should have that in our minds as, as part of the background. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we had one question at the back, and I know you have a question, but I think, sir, if you have a question, yes. So we'll take yes, another three uh, questions. Thank you. Yes, Can I have a question to you, are, please? Um, Christopher Gleichen from Germany. Mm. I have a question uh, regarding something Christopher Barry said, um, and I just want to understand this. Right, you said uh, Adam Smith believed that science is the great antidote to superstition. And I think it was your remark that you said new enlightenment needs more science. So was that right? Did I get that right? Because what I see today is you have a lot of science and you have a lot of superstitions, new kinds of superstition, if we, the way that you follow sort of lies and this and all and that, that space. So how do we get, it seems that these two things don't go together anymore. They almost have parallel universe. And my question is how can you again uh, sort of connect those two because you see more and more there's a lot of criticism about experts. Experts are sort of on their way out. <laughs> Nobody's interested anymore what experts say 
except the experts themselves. <laughs> isn't, isn't that, that is sort of the question that also brought me here to really understand how we can connect that again. Um, okay, thank so. you. Um, a question here, and then we'll come to the back. A question here. Thanks. I'm uh, Dimitri Stoklos, I'm a Theo Dwot, and I wanted to ask, uh, I was um, intrigued by uh, Chris Berry's and Neil Case, and of course uh, John Case uh, exposition here on, on the invisible hand. And I think it's sort of, uh, uh, I was wondering whether it's been individualized, <coughs> it's been used to reflect on a individual agents rather than um, embedded agents, agents that are interacting. Um, I would assume that uh, our modern conception of, of uh, economics in, implies some sort of uh, relational context. We're all interdependent. So um, I was wondering whether um, uh, Smith has been misinterpreted in that sense. Mm, thank you. And a question or a point at the back, please. <coughs> My name is Polly Armstrong. I'm from Berkeley. Um, not the university, the town. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if we can take any shred of hope from the fact that in America, where everything's so messed up at the moment, um, there are uh, legislators from both sides in Washington who are talking about breaking up big businesses and big industries again. Um, and I wonder if if we can feel that that's perhaps a way of indicating that uh, there's a, a spectrum of people who recognize what the inequality of wealth is about and how it's affecting us. Thank you very much. So we have questions on science versus superstition and false facts, uh, invisible hand and embeddedness, and breaking up big business again. I mean, it's again, is salient there. So I invite anyone who'd like to take uh, one I of those. Inside, uh, this is one of Smith's very few indicative moon statements. Science is a great antidote to superstition. Um, that's because he's man of the Enlightenment. Um, the Enlightenment is about light, removing darkness. And darkness is superstition of various degrees. Um, my parting sort of rather well, flippant shot was if you wanted to, to draw any lessons, which I already admit I'm very sceptical of, to draw any lessons from this is what in fact these terms will indicate. Um, if you believe in a new enlightenment, then it seems to me you need to follow us that, that Smithian uh, statement. You know, you will in fact believe that climate change scientists will actually triumph over uh, the rest. Um, superstition takes very forms. I mean, if you believe in a new enlightenment, you must believe in something like science as opposed to superstition. If you don't believe in new enlightenment, then, you know, God help you. But basically, <laughs> that, that's what will happen. So that, that's a, a sort of answer to the question. How you, in a sense, puncture the thrust of fake news is more news. I mean, you either take a Newtonian evolutionary theory, that is basically, you know, aggression's law, reverse aggression's law, so the good will drive out the bad, if you're that's optimistic, but enlightened people are optimistic. New enlightenment people have to be optimistic, or else, again, why is Palm Your House existing today uh, for that purpose? Uh, that invisible hand, um, I, well, it is. It's, it's, it's sort of ripped from context and all the rest of it. Smith's particular references are to individuals. There's nothing there about these not being embedded individuals. It's just about the butcher selling sausages to a customer. Uh, and, and that happens to be the case. But the, Behind that, we all know, is the institutional framework of market change, currency, uh, and norms about fair dealing, and, and, and so on. Um, whether or not this is then um, extrapolatable to a, a wider context, well, yes, because in the, the phrase that uh, John quoted in his lecture this morning from Ferguson is institutions stumble across things. So Smith has the story of the growth of a rule of law is an accidental process. Uh, it's not something that came back as some of a great idea, and that's the rule of law. It came about through what Smith calls the change of property and manners in book three. And that eventually established, by accident, he says, quite explicitly, a revolution, quite explicitly, producing a move from feudalism 
to Rockingmore Society. So that's my kind of. Thank you. Any other comments, uh, please? Yes, I'll die on the invisible hand. Uh, I think it was Paula uh, who raised this about uh, the context of uh, people talking about breaking up large businesses in the United States. Um, going back to the invisible hand, um, as has been pointed out, his view of it was nuanced. And um, he almost immediately afterwards in that section in The Wealth of Nations went on to um, discuss how it was important to have regulation of industry um, as well as uh, having the ability for individuals to compete with each other. In the context of what he break up or not break up, uh, what his concerns at this point were what he called corporations. But we, we, it wasn't what we call corporations now, they're really the guilds who formed <coughs> cartels uh, to protect their professional interests in various contexts. And he saw that as, as being against the public interest. You could, you could argue uh, they were acting in self-interest, but this, it was a self-interest which he saw as counterproductive. Uh, there weren't the extent of big businesses in his day that would have uh, uh, elicited his interest. Um, however, if you want to draw a parallel or think towards what he would have thought of today, an antitrust policy, such as in the States, and his view of the guilds, the, the professional cartels, I think that's the closest to it. And his warning that um, a need for greater regulation and control should be married with an encouragement for competition in, in the economy. Yeah, maybe I can just add to this, uh, I mean, you know, the whole diatribe against the mercantile system that we find with Adam Smith is actually a diatribe against monopoly power in trade, uh, which uh, he was very much wanted to break up. And so I think that's his equivalent yeah. for his time and place, was to, to um, destroy the big trading company's monopoly on trade. Um, I think the neo-mechanicalism in the title of, of uh, the overall title is something which we haven't particularly got to grips with yet in uh, the course of the proceedings, but I'm sure we'll, we'll come up again. Um, uh, just let me add something to the, to the um, issue of the invisible hand while I have the floor. Um, I know Franco wants to come in. I mean, it's been a wonderful metaphor for economists, um, the invisible hand, partly to say, to, to write books about why it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, so there was a you know, wonderful account of the hidden hand by Albert Hirschman about you know, when the market doesn't work as it's supposed to, people actually become creative and get round it. Uh, a wonderful book um, by um, uh, Steve Medimer called The Hesitant Hand, which is in a history of the inter interaction, uh, going to the third talk, third question, about law and economics in the US and the attempts to um, regulate big business in the, in, the, in the US, which is a series of hesitant hand moves to try and uh, break up big business and then big business taking back control. So um, Franco, I know, wants to come in on this. I just uh, <coughs> want to build up extremely briefly on what uh, Neil and Mary said in the sense that, of course, the invisible hand is very much related to the individual that interacts and so on, but the invisible hand uh, requires quite visible institutions. I mean, in a sense, Adam Smith was talking about the liberal market system. Liberal market system requires strong institution of a certain type, norms, uh, ways of interaction, and also the thing that Mary and Neil were saying. So in a sense, uh, th this idea that, that uh, you know, so you have a kind of invisible way of interacting is based very much on highly strong institutions of a certain type. And I think this is a, a very important point that we should not uh, forget about that, I just mean. And we keep coming back to this phrase, invisible hand. And there's so much said about Smith by people who know whose knowledge of Smith is confined to two quotations. Yes. <laughs> one is the reference to the invisible hand, and the other is the one about the benevolence of the uh, Baker. Yeah. 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 Uh, now, first of all, the invisible, when Smith wrote about the invisible hand, he was not anticipating Aaron de Brewer's proofs of the fundamental theorems of the of the 19th of welfare economics in the 1950s. He just wasn't. That isn't what it's about, and it isn't in the wealth of nations. And people should just forget that. And as far as the butcher and the baker were concerned. 
Um, I don't suppose Smith went to the butcher and baker any more than he went to the pin factory of the Karen mm -hmm. Iron Works. Yeah. Uh, so we may know that Smith was an appalling uh, misanthrope. Mm -hmm. He never married. He lived with his mother. I'm wondering if that's his mother. Mm -hmm. It is his mother. Yeah. Yeah. And he lived with his mother for most of his life until shortly before she died shortly before he did. Um, and there's a rather silly book entitled Who Cooked Adam Smith's Dinner, uh, which is a feminist book applauding perhaps necessarily the contribution of women to economic thought. Uh, but Mrs. Smith really didn't write the book for nations any more than um, uh, Smith had anticipated that in the book. The important thing is actually Mrs. Smith knew the butcher, would have known the butcher and baker very well. And that market transaction worked within a network of trust relationships. It was not a set of anonymous transactions, and we need to understand that. And then the question was asked, should we fully feel encouraged by the fact that people in Congress want to propose legislation, which of course won't pass, to break up Google? Uh, and I think the answer is no. Um, and the answer is no, because it's missing the point, which is not that these are horrid people and we should do nasty things to them, but that we should start thinking about business and conducting <coughs> business in very different ways. And that's what I hope the thrust of a lot of this discussion. Mm. Okay. Uh, just a, a footnote of what John said. Um, uh, Adam Smith partly chose Palmyra House because it was close to Canningate Kirk so his mother could go to church there. And he, he, did, he did love his mother deeply. But not only that, he was benevolent in a wider sense. He, he also, in this house, uh, hosted his cousin and his cousin's, her cousin's, his cousin's son, son, and basically um, paid for his education. He was also a social animal. He liked to have dinner here. And um, also he was, uh, part of a uh, dining club. So that he, he wasn't just the self, uh, self-interested, anonymous, lonely person he's often portrayed. He was himself a social <coughs> animal, as well as having described the society and the theory of moral sentiments, which you observed. <laughs> okay, so I think on this discussion of dinner <laughs> and the butcher and the baker, and I'm pleased, I think you've got a picture of Adam Smith's mother, uh, a, a good moment to, 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 to close. And thank very, would you join me in thanking the panel again? Thank you. Thank you.